Good morning. Good morning. May I speak to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So if you're listening in the psalm, there would have been a line in there that probably jumped out at you a little bit. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, make good your vows to the Most High. You hear us say it a lot. It's an offertory sentence. So it's not just a sentence designed to kind of remind you to go sit back down after the passing of the peace. (laughs) Um, It's intentional that we offer the sentence kind of at the hinge between the first part of worship in which we're focused on scripture and the second part of worship in which we're focused on the Eucharist. And if you go and turn to that page, uh, 376 or so in the prayer book, you will find there's about 10 of these offertory sentences. And you could take them actually and make a list out of them and find like a pretty good guide to how one ought to live. Um, Being filled with gratitude, being filled with forgiveness, knowing that our forgiveness of our brother and our sister is so important that if we come to God's altar with this discomfort in our hearts, maybe we should walk back out again and go solve that problem and then come back. These are sentences to live by, every single one of them. I was thinking if you wanted, you could make, you know those like swirly script wall decals that were so popular for a while? You could make a whole set of them out of offertory sentences and put them around your house, but your guests might find it odd. (laughs) The guest room says, (laughs) offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and they were just expecting like peace, love, and happiness. But indeed, this is the source of peace, love, and happiness in our lives. So while looking at the readings today, I was really excited that Psalm 50 was on the list because it's one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. It's a funny thing that that would be it. But when I read that Psalm, it's one of the places in the Bible where I feel the most like God is just saying, look, this is how it works. in just plain and simple language. And God says to us in this, among other things, Um, If I were hungry, would I tell you? It's not, right? Um, Why would I want this bull calf from your stalls or this he goat from your pens when I already have thousands of free and wild animals on every hill and in every valley? Why would God want some offering from us that was um, so domesticated? that it happily lives in a little stall when God can have what is wild and free. And so is that maybe not the better gift for God, that in us which is wild and free, not just put in a little container. Well, here, God, why don't you just have this little bit? I saved you some. I have some gladware boxes with my offering for you, (laughs) right? God wants like the whole thing. And so when I see that line about bull calves in their stalls and he goats in their pens, I always feel like me and God are in the cow shed at the state farm. And I'm saying to God, well, how about this one? Look at this cow. She's really nice, soft fur. Do you want this one? Or how about this goat? He has like really cool horns. Or how about this sheep? She produced a really fine litter of baby lambs this year. She's pretty amazing. And I want to just make these offerings to God that aren't me. And God looks at me over and over again and says, I want you. I don't want this little thing that you're offering that you can part with. I want all of you. I want the wild you, the untamed you, the uncontained you. Your whole being is actually what I desire. Because God's desire isn't because God has some lack of completeness in God and he's hungry and so we need to like feed him something which he'll like eat, digest, and come back for more. It's not how God is. God is complete in God's godness. Rather, God's desire for us is that we learn that we desire God. God wants to abide in us. God does abide in us. 
And God's desire for us is that we learn that that is so. And then from that place of learning that God is already in me, God is already abiding in me, comes that free gift, this offering that God is asking for us that we say in all of our offertory sentences. That is what it springs from, quite naturally. So if we think about the psalm and then we take our gospel reading and kind of lay it on the top, so now instead of like <laughs> me and God walking around the cow shed at the state fair, now it's like me and Jesus walking through the world. But it's kind of the same, right? The Pharisees are like, why don't you just take this little packaged, tamed gift, Jesus? This packaged person who's following all the rules and who's got it right. Don't, isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you desire? And Jesus says, well, no, actually, it's not what I desire. I want the wild and free version of you. I desire the woman who's hemorrhaging and can't stop. I desire the tax collector who made this deal so that he could have some security and safety from his family, even though he's now an outcast to his people. I desire the family that's hurt and broken, the father who lost a child. That's my heart's desire. Not that, that we keep that brokenness inside of us, dress it up on the outside, and offer that to God. But that we offer our complete and whole and broken and hopeful selves to God. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Amen.